Well, hello everyone. My name is Brett Trigano. I'm an aquatic biologist with Cortha Conservation and welcome to our latest series in our Lunch and Learn. This one's called Biomonitoring in the Cortha Watershed. So I'd like to take about 15 minutes of your time or so and introduce you to some of our biomonitoring programs and just biomonitoring in general and the advantages it has in monitoring the health of our watershed. The really cool thing about biomonitoring is we're using life to help tell us on what's going on in our environment. So biomonitoring is essentially using living organisms to track changes in our environmental health. We can use anything from plants, fish and wildlife, algae, fungus, anything living in water. And because it spends most of its life cycle in water or all of its life cycle, um, it's really under the impact of everything going on on land that ultimately drains down into the water. And so the health of certain, for example, fish and wildlife communities or plant communities can really indicate what's going on, uh, not only in, for example, the aquatic resource, like a stream or a wetland, but also upland and how we're doing in our, in our terrestrial and watershed health. When we talk about the Kawartha watershed, we're really talking about this area here in Southern Ontario. We're one of 36 conservation authorities in the province, and we're located in the Kawartha Lakes region. So just east of Lake Simcoe. In terms of our major population centers you might be familiar with, we have Lindsay that's kind of centered in our jurisdictional area. We also have Fenland Falls, Port Perry, Omimi, Bob Cajun, and several other small communities. So our jurisdictional area is about 2,500 square kilometers, and it includes um, all or a significant portion of five major Kawartha lakes, being like Scugog, Balsam Lake, Cameron Lake, Sturgeon Lake, and Pigeon Lake. And basically the role of a conservation authority is to help manage our natural resources, things like our forests, our surface water, our groundwater resources, um, and keep people safe from environmental hazards, things like erosion uh, and flooding, for example. And so a core mandate of ours is regulations and planning. So for example, if you would like to build or develop in an area that we call a hazard area, um, then you would require a permit from us. Um, say for example, you wanted to build a dwelling in a floodplain or uh, interfere in any way with a creek, say install a culvert and that type of thing, then we have the expertise here to basically help you through this process and make sure the stability of your structure will be maintained or the house is you know, designed appropriately or the deck or structure or whatever that development might be. And we basically wanna make sure that our water resources um, and people are safe from, from development. We also have an environmental monitoring arm, uh, the Integrated Watershed Management Department, which is a, the department through which I'm from. And we do a lot of surface and groundwater monitoring, looking at the water quality of our, of our lakes and our tributaries, also our water levels and water flow conditions. We're active in um, forecasting the weather and how that might change, for example, how rain events might change the water levels and flow conditions. And we also do some stewardship. So we help landowners uh, improve the health of their lands on private properties. Uh, for example, farmers who want to do something um, for their creek or, or their crops, uh, shoreline landowners that want to do something to benefit the health of their, the health of their lake. Uh, you know, if you're in town, for example, uh, we also, uh, we have a lot of extension services to help people out both financially and with technical assistance to do good things on their property. We also own um, a number of conservation areas and um, our flagship property is where our administrative center is located. And that's at Ken Reed Conservation Area, just north of Lindsay, uh, near the shore of, of Sturgeon Lake. And we also help our municipal partners with special projects. Uh, so these are kind of one-off projects where 
They require the expertise of, for example, hydrologist or a water quality specialist or a floodplain mapping technician. And some of our recently completed projects include lake management planning, where we're working with local stakeholders and community groups to come up with recommendations on maintaining in perpetuity the health of their lake. Um, also floodplain mapping, so looking at a particular area of focus, whether that's an urban center or a particular creek, and modeling you know, how high, for example, we expect the creek to swell um, during a rainstorm, and various other special projects. But today it's about aquatic biomonitoring, and aquatic meaning water, and so we just like to um, remind ourselves of what type of aquatic resources that we're talking about. And here in the Kortha Lakes region, we are blessed obviously with um, an abundance of surface water and um, in particular lakes. So these are kind of the high profile aquatic resources on our landscape. Anything from the large kind of typical Kawartha lakes, like a balsam lake, for example, um, but also a also refers to kind of more smaller ponds, you might call them. There's a lot of farm ponds, for example, on our landscape or recreational ponds. And on the bottom center there is a vernal pool. So these are our temporary lakes um, that develop, for example, through snow melt, which are very important for uh, breeding amphibians, for example. We also have relatively large flowing water bodies, um, often referred to as rivers. So within, um, on our landscape that connect all of our major lakes, usually there's a large river, for example, the Scugog River or the Fenland River, the Bob Cajun River. There's also several other kind of more isolated rivers like Mariposa Brook or Nonquan River that are relatively large features on the landscape as well. Wetlands are another significant aquatic resource in our area. Anything from kind of a forested wet area that we would call a swamp to a more traditional kind of cattail marsh next to our lakes or our rivers. Um, also on the bottom left hand side, there's wetlands like a reed canary grass, like a meadow wetland that we might not traditionally think of as uh, a wetland. We might just think of it as a grassland, but these are all important areas for aquatic life. And of course, we have the large um, kind of ubiquitous wetland on our landscape as well, like the Osler Marsh. Streams is another important one. These are our relatively small flowing creeks or brooks or streams um, that flow all through our landscape, some of which are um, more temporary in nature. You might drive over them in the summer, for example, and not even know they're there. But later on, you know, the following year, the subsequent spring after a snow melt or a significant rain event, all of a sudden they're kind of a raging uh, torrent of water. And so they don't necessarily have to be uh, perennial as we call them. So they don't have to flow all year round to be called a stream. They're also, they're all of which are, are very important for certain aquatic life, particularly the bugs that we're gonna focus on. Uh, later in the presentation. And when we talk about biomonitoring, one of the very cool things is there's a lot of life uh, within plants, for example, or fish or wildlife um, that are considered sensitive. And we could focus on monitoring populations of sensitive life to give us an idea of what's going on. And one example is brook trout. And so brook trout is a sensitive fish and they're sensitive because they only live in areas that have really cold water, uh, clear water typically, uh, well oxygenated, and that have a lot of kind of groundwater upwellings. And so if you sample, for example, your creek um, and you find brook trout and you find young brook trout and older brook trout and year after year, you continue to find different age classes, for example, and then you know, chances are you have a really healthy stream. And when conditions are more degraded, for example, when you've got murky water now or temperatures start to increase, um, we start to lose our groundwater inputs, chances are we're gonna lose our trout. So monitoring for trout populations uh, is really good indicator 
of uh, what's going on in our watershed. But of course, it's not just fish. Um, a lot of birds, for example, the common loon, are also can also be used um, as kind of a biomonitoring uh, organism because they're relatively sensitive to changes on our lakes. Frogs and toads, um, they're very good indicators of wetland health. So if you have a wetland, a swamp or a marsh, for example, on your property or in your community, and in the spring on those kind of warm nights, you hear lots of frogs calling and you hear that year after year, um, chances are your wetland's in pretty good shape. And we can also use plants. Um, that's a picture of wild rice. And wild rice is another uh, sensitive organism, and which is an indicator of relatively healthy lakes. And back to the bugs. At Kortha Conservation, we really rely on these bottom dwelling aquatic bugs uh, to tell us the health of our streams. And another term you might have heard for these is benthic macroinvertebrates. And these are the common bugs we find in our water resources um, in Ontario. So anything from insects like dragonflies and damselflies, um, alderflies, caddisflies, for example, to crustaceans like our sow bugs and crayfish and scuds, um, various worms and snails and clams. Um, they all have an important role to play in our aquatic ecosystem, but they can also be used uh, to tell us what's going on as far as water health. For example, we talked about sensitive organisms. Well, these three types of aquatic insects are also sensitive. So mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies. So if we were to go out and sample the creek in your property or in your community, if we have relatively high populations, high numbers of these organisms, chances are your creek is doing relatively healthy. And in our area, we have sampled a couple hundred different sites across our Kortha Conservation jurisdiction. And the average we get for these critters is about 21% of all the bugs we collect at a site. So mayflies plus caddisflies plus stoneflies is approximately on average 21% of the entire bug community at a sampling site. And so we can use this as a reference point. If we, for example, sample a site and only collect 5% of mayflies, caddisflies and stoneflies, that's below average. Um, so we might expect, you know, something going on, probably de degraded conditions. If we get something that's above 21%, then chances are it's relatively healthy. So these are considered sensitive organisms. Here's some examples of, of photos of them. Caddisflies are really cool. Most of the different taxa um, or type of organisms, they build these cases, these homes out of rocks or plant debris or silk. Um, and so if you pick up a rock on your stream and you look at it and you see some type of case, chances are there's a caddisfly living in it. And of course, most of these um, bugs have an adult form. And so they'll, they'll live in the creek for days to months to sometimes years, and they'll emerge as a terrestrial flying adult. Here's some examples of mayflies. People commonly refer to these as shad flies as well. Um, around large water bodies in the spring, you might see swarms of them around a light, um, and they'll also have a emerge as a terrestrial adult and to, to lay their eggs and repeat their life cycle back into the water. Stoneflies are our most sensitive um, of the three groups, and they're very similar to brook trout in that they're only typically found in kind of our cold, clean, well oxygenated streams. Now, conversely, there's also what we consider tolerant organisms. So this is the opposite of sensitive, and these bugs tend to only be found in our most kind of degraded sites. Um, so there's lots of impacts to the creek, whether it's been changes to the flow conditions, lots of murky water from silt and sediment, 
or a lot of the vegetation's been removed, for example, or the watershed's been paved over. Um, what that means is that typically you get less of those stoneflies, caddisflies, and mayflies, and the community shifts to now more prominence of tolerant organisms. And isopods, sow bugs, and aquatic earthworms or oligochaetes are two examples of really tolerant organisms. So if we see a lot of these when we sample a creek, um, chances are it's not doing so well. And again, um, when we sampled about 200 or so streams in our area over the last number of years, the average is about 8%. And so that's now a benchmark. Um, so we can use that and the same principle applies if we um, have significantly more than 8% of these two indicator organisms, then chances are our streams are, are relatively degraded. Here's some examples of, of what they look like. Uh, an isopod is, uh, you might have seen them in your, uh, the terrestrial form in your basement, in a moist basement. It's like a, the pill bug or a potato bug. And an aquatic earthworm um, is a segmented worm um, that can be relatively small or large, depending, that lives in the sediment. Cool thing about sampling for bugs in streams is it's really low tech. You don't need any sophisticated equipment or gadgets to collect the information and to tell you about the health of the stream. So all you need is a net and you basically what we call kick and sweep. So most of the bugs live in the sediment. So in the, the stream bed in amongst the rocks or the sand or the silt. And we kick and sweep to dislodge the, the, the bugs into a net. And we follow a standard protocol, um, the Ontario Benthos Biomonitoring Protocol. It's just a series of ways where we can do things consistently. So we can compare apples to apples, for example, from one site to another. And we take the sediment and we filter it. So we're left with just the bugs and we put them into a tray and um, we start picking them. And uh, we at least pick about 100 at a minimum um per our collection area which usually equates to about 300 per site and we put them into a jar and we identify them uh typically using a microscope i mentioned the obbn this ontario benthos biomonitoring network and the really cool thing about this is when you have a standardized protocol um, and kind of infrastructure in place then anybody on the landscape can collect data that can contribute to a large data set. And here's a, a map showing all of the OBBN sample sites in the province. And we are here and we have about 162 or about 5% of all the OBBN records in the province. And so we can compare, for example, what we find here with what they find in the Toronto area or out east in the Ottawa area, um, et cetera. One of the kind of deliverables, I'll call it, so one of the uses of our information is to report on the health of our watershed. And um, you might have heard of a watershed report card, and it's a way that, similarly like what they do in schools, we use this to report on the health of our waterways using kind of standard um, indicators. And the, the bugs, um, in addition with total phosphorus, which is a key nutrient for algae growth, and E. coli, um, which is a bacteria, um, to collectively we use those to grade our watersheds or our subwatersheds, which is basically uh, a named stream, for example, that occurs within our overarching Kortha Conservation Jurisdiction. We grade them according to A, B, C, D, uh, or F. Um, and you can see here, most of our of our watersheds for a surface water quality get a range of about um, in and around a C to a D, so a fair to a poor based on those parameters. We also use the bug community as an indicator of flow permanency. Um, a stream on the landscape could, for example, might flow all year round, which we consider perennial. Um, or it might only flow, for example, after a rain event and then dry up 
we consider that ephemeral. And then those streams in the middle where um, they might flow for many months of the year and then dry up, for example, only during the summer. And um, I mentioned we have a planning and regulations component to, to our work. And so we help, you know, bugs are used to help distinguish um, between an intermittent stream um, and a permanent stream. So for example, we regulate uh, permanent streams and we're very interested in development in and around a stream that flows all year round. Uh, we're not so um, interested, for example, in a stream that might flow, even though it's important for the aquatic ecosystem from a planning and regulations point of view, ephemeral streams aren't as important. Um, we, we, don't, we don't have a microscope on them as much as we do the permanent streams. So bugs, um, for example, if invertebrates are present or absent, um, and the types of them that are in there can help us distinguish um, if this stream is ephemeral, intermittent, or permanent. It also helps set expectations in terms of how much vegetation we need to maintain along our creeks. And studies have shown that um, anywhere from just a couple meters of natural vegetation along the banks of our creeks, for example, trees and shrubs or grasses, can really help to prevent erosion. Um, but for aquatic habitat and setting targets for development, for example, um, it's more like the 15 to 30 meter range or above. And so we can sample a stream if there's a development proposed on a stream. We can sample it and if we get sensitive life, for example, then chances are we need to keep more of a 30 meter vegetative buffer um, or a vegetated uh, protection zone to maintain that healthy creek. Whereas if we get more tolerant organisms, you know, perhaps a 15 meter or a slightly less um, natural vegetation protection zone is all that's required. Lately, over the last five years, we've really focused on uh, monitoring urban streams. And so urban streams are streams that run through our towns um, and urban centers or hamlets. And we found that um, there's a lot of activity going on in terms of subdivisions and development, and there's a lot of paved surfaces. And what that means is these streams, um, you know, at least visually appear to be um, not as healthy as some of our other streams. And when we looked at, for example, some preliminary data with Fleming College for the streams in Lindsay, that was exactly the case. Um, we looked at three creeks, Jennings Creek, Albert Street Creek, and Sucker Creek. And when we sampled for um, benthic invertebrates, so these bottom dwelling stream bugs, we found that on average, we're getting fairly poor to poor to very poor conditions in our urban streams. And so this caused us to think, um, there's probably a lot more impacts going on in these urban streams than, than in others. So we're, we're actually focusing our programming on these areas um, to help with more sustainable development moving forward. For more information on the topic, um, there's a lot of information out there through Google. Uh, if you Google Kortha Conservation Watershed Monitoring, you will get to our website where there's a lot of um, technical reports and other information on the types of on the types of uh, monitoring programs we offer, and that we and, and the, the bugs and the other and the fish and the plants that we monitor. Um, in addition, if you Google Ontario Benthos Bio Monitoring Network, um, you can get to that website which I showed you the map of, and you can find out what samples have been done in your area of interest. And um, you can always feel free to e email me, btrigono at kortheconservation.com, or my phone number is there as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have on the topic. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this brief introduction on biomonitoring, and thank you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.